Hello, guys, gals, non-binary pals, forgotten deities, data ghosts, and other. Welcome to the Sci-Fi Lab. I'm your host, DJ Squared, and with me is a special guest. Hello, I'm Julie Huguenie. I'm uh, I hail from the Department of Modern Languages, and I am uh, also specialized in science fiction literature. Yep. And so we're just gonna we're just gonna jump right into those uh, interview questions that I <laughs> told you about. Um, you know, our standard interview questions. So, uh, what was your like first experience with science fiction? I grew up with science fiction in some way, um, a lot through movies that I watched when I was a kid with my dad. I grew up in Star Wars as a child of the 80s and on Back to the Future. And I remember Stargate was a big uh, uh, epiphany to me because I really loved it. And uh, The Abyss and all those kind of 1980s science fiction that just stick with you for the rest of your life. Okay, okay. Uh, Harper's gonna be so so upset that she missed this because she would actually have somebody to talk about to talk about Stargate with. Oh, Stargate is fantastic. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but it works. It really, and it's one of those. Even for with Back to the Future, I know that they put a lot of effort into, you know, like remaking the fifties uh, to make everyone really believe that the, the action takes place in the fifties. And for Stargate, they really took pains to show you like three suns or three moons or whatever just to make you believe you're on another planet but I think the audience is just ready to believe it anyway <laughs> and when I was a kid I definitely didn't notice that the cars were 1950s cars or that you know it was another world I was just so ready to just just take the information at face value it's a new planet okay let's go yeah I, I, I loved it and I think it speaks to we want to believe yeah we all do. We all want to believe. Yes. Where's those X File fans? Yes. I know you're out there. <laughs> all right. Um, oh gosh, I was just gonna say a thing and then I forgot. Okay. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I was gonna talk about suspension of disbelief because mm -hmm. yeah, we talked about this in an earlier episode last last season on the Sci Fi Lab was different suspensions of disbelief, especially like between me and my co-host Harper. Because I had this big old suspension of disbelief. It's just like, all right, we're gonna... You're telling me that this is legit? Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of us want to, like, As, jump in yeah. and take everything at face value. I mean, I know a lot of people who are, like, super skeptics. So I'm just like, can you can you guys chill? Don't ruin it for everyone. <laughs> Don't ruin it. But science fiction is asking you to believe something that's not... That's different, but the rules of the rest of the world are still apply. I mean, there's still gravity, there's still a lot of things. And so as long as the rules of the world don't change that much, and it's a recognizable world, I'll believe that aliens are yeah. real or the abyss, you know, those creatures definitely dwell at the bottom of the sea or that, yes, we moved in time, we just went back in time. So as long as the, the rest of the world is credible, then I'll believe anything. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely some spooky shit at the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. there, oh, is, yes. there is definitely. Like, there's the confirmed spooky shit, and then there's the things that we have not confirmed, but I believe are down there. That's true, that's true. All right, uh, so what's your favorite subgenre of sci-fi? I specialize in uh, end-of-the-world stories. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on the figure of the last man on Earth. Uh, and since I'm more of a 19th century... Uh, literature person. I worked a lot uh, with uh, H.G. Wells and who, you know, in the time machine, oh, yeah. the, the, the character goes to the end of time when everyone's dead. And in the yeah. War of the World, it's just, yeah, the Earth almost gets annihilated by Mars. Uh, so I, I work a lot on that. And uh, in French, I'm, a, I'm French. I was born and I was raised in France. And my dissertation was in French, in French literature. And mm -hmm. we also, in French, have a lot of End of the world scenarios uh, that are yeah. a lot less famous than H.G. Wells or even Mary Shelley, who wrote about the end of the world. But we have some last men that are worth exploring, I think. And so I worked a lot on that. But this branches out in a lot of directions. I've, I've also worked on um, eco horror or eco uh, um, stories about ecological disasters that end the world. So and the eco apocalypse. Yeah, pretty much. You know, like um, the um, the ice caps melt, and then there's pathogens that are released, or 
Um, I love uh, The Day of the Triffids, which is a 1950s book about um, humanity goes blind and the plants kind of take over and start eating us. Hmm. And it's always framed as it's our fault. We did something wrong. And well, yes. <laughs> well, yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, so that it branches out into the 20th century, definitely, and into very current um, things we're scared of. Very current. Ah, uh, uh, current events. Yeah, exactly. Gotta love that topical. Uh... It always gets back to current events. I think science fiction is still very much a thing now because it keeps telling us about our fears, and whatever they are, they can take every shape that we want. This is why you, you've done a thing on zombies, right? And a uh, podcast we, recently? We did, last week was Humans vs. Zombies, which mm-hmm. what, which is like an on-campus role-playing game slash really, really big game of tag. <laughs> <laughs> well, zombies are, are whatever you're scared of, right? Yeah. yeah. The nuclear fallout, and now it's a virus, and now because we're scared of different things now that we were in the 70s or during the Cold War. So science fiction takes the shape of whatever you're scared of. Uh, and that's really why it's never going to go extinct. We're always going to be scared of something. Yep. Even if it's just ourselves. Yeah, it's always, it's always I think in the end, it's always our fault. Somehow. We're always yeah. the bad guys. Which is super, inter- super interesting that we're like the bad guys, but especially like in Golden Age science fiction where we're always the good guys. So it's like, it's our fault, but we're also the only ones who can fix it. Yeah, but it's really a triumph. Yeah. So, okay, you fixed what you messed up. Mm. It's like an even, it's an equilibrium. It's not like, yes, humanity yeah. wins again. No, it's just like humanity a... avoided disaster again. <laughs> so it's, it's totally different. It's a balancing of the scales, not a tipping it in the other direction. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, so you said you were French, and mm-hmm. that you did your dissertation and everything in, in French. Is there... Like, what's the science fiction community like in, in France? Or at least well, what I, you had contact with? That's a really good question. Uh, when I was a student, there, it seemed to me there wasn't much of a community. And above all, not in universities. I think science fiction is a bit too pop culture uh, for French people. <laughs> um, and when I was at school, I got the feeling that if you want to go into literature, you got to stick to the classics and the basics and... And, and not necessarily venture into pop culture. This is why when I came to the US, I loved it. Uh, because as a student, I could write my final paper about whatever I wanted. I actually took a science fiction literature class at the University of Illinois with a charming professor named uh, Professor Huntington, who did Shakespeare and science fiction, which is really cool. Um, and so I got to the US and I was like, oh, there's the freedom to write about what I want. And there's the freedom to just write about silly subjects, which are a lot more profound than you might think. But now that I'm kind of, you know, I'm teaching science fiction and uh, I'm researching it, I'm writing articles about it, I realize that back in France, there is a community of mostly women, let's face it, who do study science fiction. And uh, I don't know where they were 15 years ago. (laughs) But it's something that's definitely developing. They were wondering where you were, too. Yeah, they were looking for me some, somewhere. <laughs> um, but no, and it's wonderful to see that there is a demand and there is... Uh, we're rec- recognizing, even in France, where people are a bit snooty and just kind of stuck up about literature, that it, science fiction is, is a thing that is worth exploring. And so so it's nice. It's wonderful. I'm, I'm enjoying both sides of the Atlantic. <laughs> well, uh, that, that's good to hear. I think... Like part of it, part of that, like this, like difference that you might have seen. Like this is just me spitballing here, mm-hmm. but especially with things like with places like Georgia Tech and everything. Like this is a fairly old school by U.S. standards, mm-hmm. but the entirety of the U.S. is very young by you know French standards. That's true. So it's probably so it might be more of an age of the institution type thing. Possibly, and I think. When you're from the old continent, you, you you do protect your 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 tradition and your and your and your literary uh, uh, mm-hmm. history. And in the U.S., I think people are just more open-minded to and to to just things that are not the canon. Uh, At the very least, where academia is concerned. Absolutely, yes, and and it's really fun. I've I've been enjoying my my 
life in the U.S. so far. It's yeah. it, just my dissertation. I don't think I could have written it the same way in France. Just m mixing genres and mixing authors and mixing languages. Uh, I was really lucky every step of the way to meet professors who were just open to the idea of what I wanted to do. And so, and coming to Georgia Tech is fabulous. I didn't know there was a science fiction minor when I moved here. But yeah, we have an entire department. <laughs> was the best thing. So I'm really excited about all of this. Yeah. I think, and, and we're, I know Lisa especially is very excited to, to have more, more people in the science fiction enclave <laughs> at Georgia Tech. We're, we're, we're going to be a little group sort of yeah. resisting pop culture, science fiction <laughs> aficionados. No, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. And it is it's, a genre that has a lot to say. Yeah. It's, uh, it has a lot to say and we're going, we're going to try to help it say it. Yeah. So, um, have uh, have you been reading or watching any sort of science fiction things lately that you'd like to talk about? I've been working on, um, since it's the 200th anniversary of the publication of Frankenstein, mm -hmm. um, I've been reading a lot of stories where men create other human beings. And my next uh, article is going to be about the difference, big difference, between creating a man and creating a woman. Because when Victor Frankenstein or God creates a man, the man is created because because it's good in itself. Like the man is yeah. creating uh, in and for himself, but the woman is always created for the man because he needs because he's lonely or he needs a companion, he needs a bride, he needs a mate, he needs something. So the woman is never really created for herself. The woman is created to be the crutch of someone else. Give him sexual relief, uh, give him, you know, love and care, give him support. And so the woman is never really, never really belongs to herself. And uh, I, I've been working on a lot of movies, like The Stepford Wives, um, even My Fair Lady, and uh, the latest movies yeah. were Ex Machina and Her. And every time it's really the story of a man who's lonely. Uh, therefore he builds a woman like Lars and the real girl yesterday I watched something called uh, over or and again and again or over and over and it's a man who loses his wife and clones her again and again and again because every time he clones her she's not the, she doesn't have the right temperament so he gets rid of the non-functioning you know bad ones mm. that don't correspond to what he wants and he keeps going, and at the end he realizes that, sorry for spoiling the movie, that he's not never going to get his wife back. And so, and it's it's really interesting to see that most of the time, the the, the looks of the woman are uh -huh. not the problem. Um, she looks fine, but, like, her mind is the problem. Um, she's unruly, so. she doesn't want to obey, she's got a mind of her own, and that's always the problematic thing. Oh, no. Yikes. <laughs> if I can just say... Yikes. Yes, it's, it's, it becomes kind of shocking when you start watching all of them. Uh, yeah. There was even a guy, and that's a real story, some guy made a sex robot made of latex who looks like Char Scarlett Johansson. Because obviously mm. Scarlett Johansson doesn't know this guy, she doesn't care about him, she yeah. doesn't want to be with him. But he's like, no, the looks are good, I'm just going to copy the shape, but have a more pliable, more obedient version of Scarlett Johansson. Mm. ready at hand well yeah a lot of the this creating a woman stories are basically that they're super creepy yes just and it's and all then, of them you know the fact that women are unruly and we have a mind of our own even like eve you know she's the one who disobeyed um the the injunction of not eating from the tree of knowledge and stuff interesting interesting uh thing about that of that story specifically is that god doesn't come out and you know punish them until adam oh, eats from true. eats from the tree because like eve wasn't there when god told adam not to eat from the tree that's true she wasn't there she didn't know that's true hey yes so um also yeah there's a yeah absolutely but you know but women still but ruin still everything. we corrupt yeah. the man that's that's pay. what men we, tend to think yeah so there's a lot to say and i don't want to bash men because they're sometimes adorable but uh, there's a lot of there's there's always an agenda when you create yeah. a woman you don't create a human being you create specifically a woman when you create a man you create him because you want a son a peer a friend you know a new human but when mm -hmm. you create a woman you 
it's like the optics are very different. Yeah. The woman is never a being in and for itself. And it's fascinating to look into this. Uh, there's a lot of copies out there because the, the original woman is not good enough. Or she doesn't want you like Scarlett Johansson. Uh, so therefore, mm-hmm. we need the same body, but just yeah. a better mind. Just, just tweak it just a exactly. little bit because that's not creepy at <laughs> all. Note the sarcasm. <laughs> all right. Um... So that's fascinating. <laughs> like, if you feel like sending any of that my way, feel free. Yeah, that would same. be so if you good. Have any, if anyone so comes good. across any readings or any more movies that I could watch about this, it's always appalling. I mean, <laughs> very telling, but... Um, but, scary. no, you were right the first time. <laughs> appalling, yeah. Definitely appalling. Yeah. I've seen so many Yikes. movies with, like, sex bots and... Hot bots and there's so many of them made out there. They're not all good, but they all have like quotable bits. Yeah. Funny. Eh, it's always at least funny. <laughs> My favorite is called Franken Hooker. It's a guy whose fiance dies and he just gathers prostitutes and just kind of you know how men how people do collage of their you know, yeah. I want the legs of Sharon Stone and the face of so he kind of yeah. does this with live prostitutes and mm. and it's it's done medically it's so funny he's like the girls are trying to seduce him and he's like no 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 let me just just measure your legs so i've got the right ratio and then he just takes them apart and builds this new girl it's funny it's really funny it's <laughs> gross and it's a lot of things but it's it's really funny it's and like if yeah you none of you can see this but i had i probably had an expression of you know <laughs> minute horror <laughs> just yeah. it's a it, but it's it, there's a twist at the end she's a okay. lot more you know free spirited that you would expect mm-hmm. those movies are hilarious they're scary but at least they're entertaining like the the only movie i can think of where making a like you make a woman just to prove that you can make a person mm-hmm. is the animated movie igor Ooh, I need to look into that. This is, um, yeah, it's just this animated kids movie where um, they're in a society where uh, villainy, specifically, you know, or mad scientists sort of rule everything. They're like lords over everything. And uh, one of the mad scientists is actually very bad at being a mad scientist. But his assistant, his Igor, um, because they all have an assistant named Igor, because... All deformed children get sent to Igor school oh, nice. so that they can learn to become henchmen and everything. So there's one Igor, he's actually very intelligent, and he's just like, well, uh, I'm going to prove that Igors are just as good as mad scientists by building a person. And nice. the person he builds just happens to be female. That's great, and yeah. So I've never heard of a story where, yeah. yeah, where the person they built just happens to be a female. It's like, like, yes, they did fall in love, but he didn't build a woman because as a companion, like yeah. as a companion, he did it to win an evil, a mad scientist competition. And I think, yeah, and a, and a lot of that, I think there's the the anxiety that okay, if I make a woman, then she can reproduce, then she can make more. Because women, mm-hmm. we can create people, yeah, with our own bodies. And I think that's it's like, ha, also women don't need your mad science exactly. to make people. And and there's a lot of fears about this. And I think it's a power that we have that mad scientists just are scared of and Mm -hmm. and want to emulate. Yep. Because they, I guess they all take the root of, uh, you can't be scared of a thing if you control it. Exactly. And yeah, and, and, and making a woman is losing this control because Mm -hmm. then just give the possibility to reproduce to someone else. I mean, it's not really hard to make a human, Mm -hmm. um, you need us two people but like the scientist is like i'm gonna be the only one i'm gonna be the father and the mother so yeah pretty much the god of this person and that's how uh, frankenstein starts and it's still extremely interesting to read it nowadays and i th- hope a lot of people read it because it's the 200th anniversary also because it's fascinating yeah i know um a lot of people have read it re- recently or at least that i've seen because online there's a, a lot of um, mostly people um, joking about how Victor Franken Victor Frankenstein is one the actual monster and two should have just learned to love his son. 
Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a tale of bad parenting. Yeah, the the um, real crime of Frankenstein is being a bad dad. Yeah, the the, the scientist checks out the second his, his child is born. He has one of those fainting spells and just wakes up three months later and his kid is turning badly. So yeah, no, no, there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot to say about this. And it's interesting to see that before he creates the creature, he's like, I'm going to make a, a new species and that will be their father and their god and it's going to be wonderful. But then when he's asked to make the, the bride, the mate, he's like, oh no, it's going to be a terrible uh, uh, breed of new people who are going to be just terrible and, and, and kill us all. And it's just like, hmm. What, a, what has changed? Oh, you've been asked to make a woman, so you're losing this kind of control. Mm -hmm. And, and the, your, your species is therefore losing its benevolence. Like, all of a sudden, yeah. you see them as monsters. So, yeah, Victor Frankenstein will not be winning any Father of the Year awards. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so I think uh, we're going to wrap this up. Last question. Mm -hmm. uh, would, do you have any specific recommendations of science fiction that you think like anyone and or everyone should read? Ooh, um, yes. Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> I will say that yeah, um, The Day of the Triffids is really fun to read. Uh, it's, it shows that, you know, in post-apocalyptic stories, it's really about like society and how it reorganizes, how it, and, and it's a chance to kind of start over. Do we want to make the same mistakes? Do we want to learn from them? And, and so I, I, what I like about a lot of science fiction, it's, it's usually um, books about society. There's a lot of things, a lot of, so this is a really good one. Uh, Planet of the Apes is a French book. It was written by a French author named Pierre Boulle. And you can read it because the twist at the end is different than in the movie. So Ooh. it's pretty cool. <laughs> and it's the story is really kind of really cool. Um, there's also something that I want to work on, still on men and women uh, relationships. It's called Not With a Bang. I think the guy who wrote it, it's a short story. It's like four pages. Uh, the guy who wrote it is Damon Knight. Uh, and it's about what if just, just one woman and one man left at the end of the world and the woman... Um, just doesn't want to repopulate the earth. <laughs> and what is the guy going to do to convince her or not? And it's really fun. And I think mm -hmm. that's what I'm going to be working on. Uh, after this whole creating women thing, I want to work on how do social relations work, um, you know, at the end of the world when there's only two people left. That's it. I mean, that, sound, that sounds really fascinating. I'm going to be honest. So, um... Thank you so much for Thank you for, for having me over. Here. All right, so uh, I'm DJ. I'm Julie. And this has been the Sci-Fi Lab. Thanks for listening. <laughs>